Hello and welcome to the fourth rivers session. This one is going to be looking at the rivers long profile. So by the end of this session, you should be able to identify the changes that occur from the river's source to mouth along its length um, and be able to identify how channel shape, the valley profile, the gradient, the discharge and velocity, etc. can all change along its course with some snippets of a named case study. So just to help you kind of exemplify in an exam if you needed to, we're going to look at the river D. So um, what we mean when we talk about the river's long profile is the river's kind of overall shape. Now if you did a cross section of a river, um, and, and unfortunately you can't because rivers wind around all over the place, you can't ever do a cross section, but you can simplify a cross section into kind of three main areas um, uh, along a river's course, you know, from source to mouth. The first section, you know, in terms of from, from its source, is what we call the upper course of a river, the upper section. In the middle part of it we call the middle course, understandably, and the bit that's lowest to uh, the ground, or, or, or closest to sea level, is called the lower course. So you've got those three different sections of a river. Now, within those three sections, the characteristics can change because the gradient, the slope angle can change, but also other things are happening. So when a river starts, it's got the least amount of water it's ever going to have. It's a piddly little, you know, stream or a little brook or a little, you know, spring somewhere. But actually, when you get near the sea, the river's mouth is at its biggest. It's got the most water it's going to hold. And that's just logical because all the while, other tributaries are adding to this drainage basin kind of to its end point, which is where it meets the sea. So, you know, it's not just, the, you know, the River Yare is not the only river in that drainage basin. It's added to by the Bure and the Wensum and the Swannington Beck and all these other little tributaries, which all combine. Therefore, the amount of water is going to get more. Uh, and there are other factors that change from the source to the mouth. So, um, one of my, oh, you know, I keep saying it's my second favourite, but I think it probably is my favourite. My favourite geography model, if I had to pick one, is the Bradshaw model because there's so much information and it's been simplified to such an extent that it's understandable by everybody, including you. Haha. <laughs> um, so, the Bradshaw model, and there is a handout of this if you don't want to. Um, uh, you don't want to draw it out, and I wouldn't suggest drawing it out. In fact, maybe just search on Google to make sure you've got a version of it. But the Bradshaw model shows you those changes in a really simplistic manner. So if you look at the, the um, diagram you can see on the screen, that is the Bradshaw model. On the left-hand side, it says upstream. So the very left-hand point is where a river begins. And as you go downstream to where it meets the sea, some things change, some things happen, and that's signified by the different triangles. So the different green triangles that vary as you go downstream. So the first one, the discharge. A river's discharge, or the amount of water a river pumps through um, in cubic meters per second, a certain point, um, is called its discharge. So essentially, a bigger discharge means more water. So what you can see what happens to the amount of water in a river as it goes downstream it gets more the, the, the triangle gets fatter okay and again it's you know not exactly like this but effectively you know, on average along a river's course you will get a, a bigger discharge until you get downstream the river should get wider so this is about channel width it will get wider as you go downstream it will get deeper as you go downstream it will get faster that's what velocity means as you go downstream. So all of these things and, and the amount of stuff, the load, do you remember we talked about load a couple of sessions ago, the load quantity, the amount of different sediment in the river will also increase. All of these factors will get more with distance downstream. What will happen to particle size, however, is the opposite. So when we talk about load quantity, amount of load, that gets more but the size of that load gets smaller. Now again, with attrition in the water, uh, that erosional process, that makes sense because you know big boulders or pebbles are gonna bounce into each other all the time, they're gonna break off little particles, and eventually that's gonna happen along hundreds of miles, um, and maybe even thousands of miles, depending on the river. So eventually, by the time it gets to the mouth, it's gonna be the smallest it can be. And actually, if you take one pebble and break it into a thousand bits, that helps explain why the load quantity also increases. 
the roughness of the channel bed, how bumpy it is, it gets less as you go downstream. And again, that's because of erosion. You've got things like abrasion on the bed and banks wearing down any rough edges that there might be. So you get a nice smooth channel. And the other thing that gets less as you go downstream is the angle of gradient, the slope. So we, we said at the start of this session that the, the steepest part of a river is the very first third of its course, the, you know, the, the upper course. Then it gets less steep as you go downstream. Now at this point, you might be thinking, if you're you know, a logical thinker like me, that if the angle of slope is getting less, why is it getting faster? Because surely, with a steeper slope, that will be when the river moves at its fastest. Um, and ordinarily, you'd be absolutely right, because that is how gravity works. You know, greater gravity, gra gravi gravitational potential energy, um, therefore it's gonna, it's gonna work faster. But, if I use an analogy to help you understand why, imagine you're on uh, a, like a BMX, okay, or a mountain bike, and you're going down a mountain, okay, a really steep one, but this mountain has big boulders on it every every meter. You can't go down that mountain very fast. You have to bump over the boulder, you have to go around it, you know, that will slow you down. But if you're on a completely flat road with no boulders, no stones whatsoever on a BMX you, or a mountain bike or whatever, you will go faster, even though you're going on a flat rather than a steep slope. So the same principle occurs as a river is on a steeper slope, if it bumps into big bits of particle size along a really rough channel bed, it's going to slow it down. And the other thing is, there's more friction anyway, because the river is narrower, higher up, it's also shallower, higher up, so there's greater friction with the bed and banks. So all of this friction, and the fact that it's got small discharge, and the fact it's um, got big particles to carry, and it's really rough, mean that even though the gradient is less, the velocity can still be faster further downstream. Because downstream, you've got a wider, deeper river channel with a very smooth bed, very smooth banks, very small sediment, which reduces friction. And because it reduces friction, it means the velocity can increase. I hope that explains it. Um, there is a song, it's awful, but it's not awful. At the same time, it's brilliant. If it wasn't brilliant, I wouldn't use it in my, uh, um, my video. Um, however, it's not mine, it's someone else's. I can't remember who, it is, uh, who it's by, but I'm going to give them a little YouTube wink so they can get an extra little view on there. Um, and it will hopefully you know, talk to you or help you remember how rivers change from source to mouth. Okay, And it will, it will talk about some of these factors as well. All right, so get these notes down, make sure you've got a copy of the Bradshaw model, and then we're going to do an extra activity that leads on from this. So when I talked about how rivers angle or slope changes, this diagram shows you quite nicely that the source is up here and the upper course is where it's steepest. It has the most gravitational potential energy because it's highest above sea level and it's the steepest slope. As you get into the middle course, it gets a bit more gently sloping and then at the lower course, it's almost flat until it reaches the sea. It's not flat because gravity wouldn't work then, but it, you know, it's almost flat as it reaches the sea. So that's the long profile. That's kind of what we mean by a cross section of a river. So this is something you need to jot down so you've got all the notes about the river's long profile. Um, it shows changes in height from source to mouth. It's generally smooth and concave, generally. Um, and the gradient is steeper in the upper course, becoming less steep towards the mouth. And we divide it into upper, middle, and lower sections. All right, now this is important. So pause the screen, get that written down, because the task that follows is essentially related very much to this section. So um, one thing that changes as we go down the upper, middle, lower course, um, is the um, valley shape and size. So in the upper course, you'll find you get kind of a V-shaped, very narrow valley. Now the valley itself is very deep and steep-sided because you've got vertical erosion going on, but um, it's very narrow, it's very shallow. So this is about, you know, on average, a metre and a half wide you might get uh, in the upper course, the river channel itself. Now this changes as you go down to the lower course, because the gravity is less, gravitational potential energy, sorry, is less, you get more 
lateral erosion taking place. So it moves left to right a bit. Now because of that, although it's not quite as steep a valley side, it's more kind of a bit a bit more U-shaped, although we wouldn't say U-shaped because that's to do with glaciation. Um, the, the river is actually about five meters wide on average. Again, I don't know where we've got the numbers from, but there we go. Um, and uh, so the average sort of width is much wider than the upper course, which is about one and a half meters wide. Um, it's also deeper as well. And then you go towards the lower course and it's very flat, it's very wide, you know, 20 meters on average, you know, width there. Um, and that's because you've got much more lateral erosion because there's very little gravitational potential energy. Um, and you've got a meandering river left to right. So you've got a very, you wouldn't even recognize this as a valley, essentially. It's just a flat floodplain area. So that is just a very clear, just looking at one aspect, the river channel, okay, how the channel changes from very narrow and very shallow to a bit wider and a bit deeper to really wide and deep. Now you can't see that that's much deeper, um, but you can very much see it's wider. So this is focused on the width. Now this is just one factor of several, and you need this handout okay this handout is going to help you massively I'll explain it and then you can apply your knowledge so it's an A3 sheet it's on 365 you know go and get it make sure you've got it saved and it's got three sections you've got upper middle and lower course and this is essentially your key so whatever color you want to use for upper course red yellow green don't care all right shade that that color and then shade this box a different color and then shade this box a different color okay so that's your key sorted then you're going to read through each of these boxes and these boxes have got three bits of information in one of those bits of information is relevant to the upper course of a river it's what you might find in the upper course one of them is what you might find in the lower course and another one is what you might find in the middle course of a river and so whichever one it is you color code it so if um, you it says here the source of the river D is however many meters above sea level on the slopes of the Diddle and Snowdonia National Park but gradient is steep okay this one says there's a lot of clues in here it's where the source of the river D is so it's the start the start of a river is going to be in the upper course so I can color code that what I've colored the upper course okay so then I've got two left one of them will be middle one of them will be lower so it says, after uh, oh, however many kilometers, the River D reaches sea level. Um, I don't even need to read more. If it reaches sea level, it's got to be in the lower course. So again, whatever color I did for lower course in the key, I color that one in. This last one must be middle, so I'm just going to color code that middle course. Okay, so now I've got one box which talks about the height above sea level, okay, and the steepness of the slope, specific to the River D in this case. Some of them are going to be a bit less specific. So large amount of load, small in size. So lots of it, but it's small. Or load size reduced, or small amount of load, large in size. Use the Bradshaw model you've got in your notes to help you work out which one of these is upper, which is middle, which is lower. Do that for every single one of those boxes. Every single one of those boxes has got, is either upper, or sorry, has an upper statement, a middle statement, and a lower statement in it. You have to color code it. This bit that's also on your handout will help you because it, it gives you specific information, but also your Bradshaw model will help you too. And this effectively is, is the majority of this task today. So if you can color code this upper, middle, lower, you will have, with an example as well, a really good understanding of what the Bradshaw model shows you. Okay, so this upper, middle, lower course changes from source to mouth. Okay, what this diagram shows you you'll have a really good explanation or a good um, in-depth knowledge with an example, the River D, um, of how the river changes from source to mouth through the upper, middle and lower courses. Okay, so pause the screen to get that completed. Find this on 365, please. It is there and use color coding. Don't do cutting and sticking. Okay, that's a waste of time. You can use your knowledge to apply your knowledge to get a good example of this upper, middle, lower, um, source to mouth um, information completed. Okay, so hopefully you have completed that section now. I'm just going to go through the answers really briefly. I'm, I'm looking at a very small text on my screen to help you. So we did the first one, okay, that was upper, then lower, then middle. 
I'll take this box next. Large amount of load, small in size, that is lower course. Load size reduced middle, and then small amount of load, large in size, is upper course. Uh, this next box, I'm waving over. Flood plains and levees, more sinuous meanders and oxbow lakes are found here. This one is the lower course. Rapids, small meanders and oxbow lakes, um, small flood plain is middle, and waterfalls, gorges, potholes, rapids, upper. This box, lateral erosion more important, some vertical, some deposition on the inside bend of meanders. This one is middle, vertical erosion dominant is upper, and then uh, less erosion, only a little lateral, um, is uh, lower course. Next box, valley is narrow and steep with high valley sides, V-shaped, that's upper. This one is lower, and then this one is middle. Um, this next one, the river begins flowing through hard igneous rock, that is upper. Then you've got your middle, then lower. Um, the diagrams, this one is upper, middle, lower. This bottom left box here, in the lower D valley, average rainfall, so that's lower. Talks to you about less rainfall. Um, the middle one is middle, and then the average rainfall exceeds 3,000 millimeters is upper course. And then lastly, channel is um, narrow, shallow, full of angular rocks, that's upper course. The um, river channel is wide, deep and smooth, that's the lower course, and then this is the middle course at the bottom there. Okay, so if you didn't get those, you know, you could pause the screen or just go back, okay, it only took about three minutes to go over them. I wave the little mouse cursor over where you need to be looking at, so check your answers, please, against what I've just said. And there is one more task that follows, which, um, you know, I want to impress upon you because it's a good geographical skill, which hasn't come up yet, but they talk about it, so you, we need to be ready for it. All right, so um, here we go. We need to be looking at contours. Okay, so when it comes to rivers and ordnance survey maps, ordnance survey maps come up every now and then in geography, and when they do, students, I don't know why, they always struggle. Um, so you know, throughout these sessions, these individual sessions, as well as a revision session specific to it, but um, I try to weave in where you might find these kind of OS map skills appearing. So You've got two maps here, and the main difference between the two maps that I can see anyway is that map A has got all of these different orange lines, very, you know, very lots, lots of them, whereas map B has only got a couple. And that tells me that map A, straight away, as a geographer that knows maps, map A is very steep, map B is not very steep. So if I wanted to have a question river related, I'd say which one of these maps is more likely to be in the upper course? Uh, and hopefully all screaming at the screen saying map A because it's steep therefore it's going to be likely to be in the upper course whereas map B looks very much like it's near the lower course of a river because it's very um, gently sloping almost no gradient whatsoever you know this spanning sort of five meters so we've got the relief there but what I really want to draw your attention to is this idea of cross sections now if you've got the Highland Cow there are um, there's pages 50 and 51 that will help you with this, but otherwise, you know, get a bit of graph paper or just just follow along, okay? And I, it's like a little tutorial you can just listen to. Cross sections. When it comes to drawing a cross section, what it means is when you see a map, and I'm going to put this on there, I can see this map and it's a flat thing in front of me, but I can tell you that it's steep, all right? And I know that it's steep because I know what these lines mean. If you have to draw a cross section, it's really where you start to realize this map, these, these, you know, what it looks like on a flat screen, what it would look like side on, side profile. So you are effectively trying to realize the mountains that are represented by these contour lines. Now, the best way to do that is actually um, using a little bit of graph paper, and you're going to create like a little line graph essentially. So A to B, that's our little, what we call a, our transect. A transect is just a line drawn across a landscape. So if I was doing my Duke of Edinburgh award or I was in the Scouts or wherever it might be, I want to get from A to B. I want to walk from A to B, okay? But I want to know what I'm in for along the way. 
So by what I'm in for, I mean how steep it is, how many mountains I'm going to have to go up, go down, whatever. So on a flat map, it just looks like, oh, I'm just going to walk from A to B and it's, I don't know, straight line distance, five miles, whatever, five kilometers, don't mind. But we need to know if we go up or down. So if you look directly below A is A, directly below B is B, and we've got this line, which is the same length as our transect. So I've physically got a bit of graph paper and I've put it next to my line on my map. Okay. Once I've done that, okay, and I know the scale of the map, I know how far I'm going, and now I'm going to plot on this graph what the landscape is going to do as I walk. Am I going to be going uphill, downhill, whatever? So, along this line, as soon as I get a contour line that crosses it, there we go, there's one, I'm going to get a little ruler, and I'm going to draw a line that I'm going to just follow my ruler down, I'm going to do a little mark here. Okay, on the x-axis. All right. Once I've done that mark, I'm going to go to the next one. Okay. So there's another point, and I'm going to again. I'm going to use a ruler. I'm going to just put a little mark here on my x-axis, and I'm going to do all the same every time a contour line crosses over my transect. This one on the map. I'm going to track it down directly in line. I'm going to just do a little dot on my x-axis. So you're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 dots. 12 dots that go all the way along A to B, just on our x-axis. So now I've got my 12 dots, I need to look at another thing. I need to look at what the highest contour line is. Okay, so we've got 50 here, we've got 40 here, um, and you have to assume that this is also 40, all right, because um, even though it, this, so this essentially is just because we know that 30 is next and it's going to go up in tens. So these are 40, 40. So the highest one is 50, 50 meters. And so on my y-axis, I'm going to start to plot height. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 meters. Okay, because I know that's my highest point. So on my x-axis, I've got all the little points at which my route is going to cross a little change in height because that's what contour lines show. And on my y-axis, I'm going to use that to work out how high the land is. So if I'm drawing a line, I'm going to start here. And then as soon as I get to my first point, that point is 10 meters above sea level. So I've got to do oh, there's a dot here. So my line from A to B is going to go like that. And so I've got a little smooth little sort of upslope there. Then it doesn't take very much longer before I then go up another 10 meters. So I've gone from sort of a to a sort of gentle slope, and then all of a sudden I've gone up much steeper to get to my next point. And then again, I'm going to go up another 10 meters very quickly. So what you should find, okay, is that you get you're plotting basically a little kind of double sloped section where. From here onwards, you've actually got quite a gentle slope. If you look at it side on, I wish I'd drawn it on there for you, really. But if you look at it side on, you've got a very gentle slope, gently, gently sloping down towards B. Whereas the first part of your walk here is very much steeper. So you've got to prepare to put the work in early, okay, on your walk from A to B. All right, and if you've got, you know, a man in a wheelchair on the Duke of Edinburgh expedition with you, well, you would, I don't know, um, then you might have to work a little bit harder or take it in shifts to go up that first section and then you know once you get past here it's all fun and games because you can just let them go and they go wee all the way down the bottom so um cross sections that's me explained that bit a good geographical skill if you really are struggling remember i'll just go back highland cow pages 50 51 when you next get an opportunity there is an activity that you can use and i can give you some graph paper if you want as well um, and if you want, there's probably a YouTube tutorial somewhere out there that tells you how to do contours or map contours on, on um, from OS Maps using graph paper. All right, that is me uh, done for this next session. So that is the fourth lesson of Rivers completed. Um, thank you very, very much for listening, and I will see you next time.